Hello and welcome to this video. The next in our Genesis series we're going to take you through the rainbow. And this is the covenant of the rainbow that we see in Genesis chapter 9 verses 8 through 17. And just thought I would give you a little science lesson to go with it, but nothing too bad. But here you go. Just thought I'd take you through the rainbow real quick first, and then we'll get into the text. So there's your violet, blue, green, yellow, red, and so on. And so, anyway, let's jump into the text now and see what we can see. And so, uh, we're going to be looking again, as mentioned, Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. And let's just read it first, and it says, And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark, to every beast of the earth, and I will establish my covenant with you, Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of the flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign, or this is the token of the covenant, which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for everlasting generations. I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Wow, so a lot to that, um, and this is a very dense, actually, portion of scripture, and if you'll notice that it's extremely repetitive, it just keeps repeating um, over and over and over and over again, the um, covenant, first of all, and you'll see that the covenant is actually between um, verses 8 and 11. And the covenant is basically stating that God is never again going to flood the entire earth and destroy the entire earth and everything on it with a flood of water. And so you can uh, probably understand that, especially at the time directly after the flood, that was going to be a very important uh, covenant for them to understand because otherwise... Every time um, the rain started up again and the new hydrologic uh, cycle that the earth was now uh, entering into, that that was uh, going to be a sign of great um, worry for everybody because they're wondering, uh-oh, is this um, going to happen again? And so, um, clearly... Uh, God needed to make sure that everybody knows that that was a one-time event. Uh, the earth is never going to be destroyed again in that manner. Uh, it is going to be destroyed again by fire. And um, that is yet future in from our perspective at this time. But the flood of water was a one-time event. And so God wants to make it expressly clear that there is never going to be another worldwide catastrophic flood that destroys everything. And so this covenant is actually a covenant that is made 
um, with light and water. And I uh, was using a prism here in our object lesson for um, to get the effect of the rainbow um, here for our object lesson, but uh, the way that rainbows actually work is actually something that gives us clues, uh, si and I'm speaking scientifically, physics, physics-wise, uh, the way rainbows work in the sense of physics, um, it gives us some clues as to the history of creation and the various things that we've talked about in some of our other uh, videos, uh, especially at the beginning when we were talking about light in Genesis 1-3. Uh, you can go back and watch uh, that video. That was actually our uh, the most watched video of this series so far um, with the let light be. And that's the one where the object lesson was the light bulb coming out of the mouth. Um, God speaking into existence the manifestation of his light and so uh, that's a big point of confusion for a lot of people a lot of people will if you're on uh, um, if you're ever asked you know what's the first thing God created the typical answer is the Sunday school answer the church answer um, go ahead and just don't be an obnoxious know-it-all just go along with the program and give them the answer they want, which is light. Um, but if you want to know the true reality of it, um, first of all, God never created light. Um, and how do we know that? Well, we know that from 1 John chapter 1, um, verse 5. And let's take a look at that one. Let me find it here real quick. I think I have it up already. Um, and maybe I don't. So let's let's actually uh, um, get it up real quick, and let's look at First John one five, and let's take a look at um, what it says. It says, "This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all." And so when you understand that. Um, and if you look at the Greek term, um, which, let's go ahead and take a look at it real quick just to verify this. And you can see that when it says the word light here, God is light. Notice that's the Greek word phos. Um, and uh, if we go take a closer look at it, let's hear the Greek pronunciation. G fifty four fifty seven, Fos. 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 Okay. And so, um, from an obsolete uh, fail to shine or make manifest, especially by rays. Um, and so, you can go do a, a word study here, and you can see that. Um, it says, you know, light, light emitted by a lamp, heavenly light, um, anything emitting light, a star, fire, uh, because it is light and sheds light, a lamp or a torch, brightness of a lamp. Okay, and here, um, metaphorically, you know, these are um, attempts at understanding it in, in that metaphoric sense, but at the same time, um, if you go look at those uh, first Genesis lessons that we did, we kind of broke it down and went into this in great depth and in great detail. But you'll, you'll note that it never says that God created light. It just says, and God said, let there be light. Um, or let light be, if you want to translate it directly, word for word, in the order that the words are in Hebrew. Let light be. And... If you go look at the other things where God says that in Genesis chapter 1, you'll notice that it says, like, and God said, let there be a firmament. But then it follows that statement up directly after that by saying, and God made the firmament. Or he'll say something like, um, 
Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. But then it follows that up by saying, and, and God created man. Um, and so he uses those four terms for create. Um, bara, which is implies to create out of nothing. Uh, divine, um, a divine quality that only God can do. And then uh, he uses the word asa, which means to form and shape. Then of man and woman, he uses the words yatsar, uh, Hebrew yatsar, which uh, is the way he formed and shaped Adam. And then uh, bana, the way he formed or, or fashioned uh, Eve from the rib which he had taken from Adam. And so when you see all those things, um, you'll note that when it talks about light, it never, ever says that God created light. And that is because what we see here in 1 John 1.5, um, this is not, strictly speaking, a metaphor. This is a definition. And there's a few of these in Scripture uh, about defining what God says about himself. Uh, so first of all, it says... God is light here in 1 John 1 5. It also talks about God being love. That's uh it's he so he so uh just um exudes that quality, that characteristic that he he is love because he's the source of love. And then uh Jesus gives us another definition of God. Uh in John 4 24, he says, God is spirit. So we know in Scripture that God has three very core essence qualities um, to his character, his nature, his makeup. And this is not, you know, when we talk about defining God, uh, some people get upset because they think you're trying to put God in a box. No, we're just trying to understand him better. And um, what he said about himself here in his word, it says he is light. God is light. God is love. God is spirit. Um, these characteristics are also a core essence of who he is. And so when we see that, uh, we note that um, in Isaiah 45, verse 7, the part where it says he creates darkness, um, God is the one that created darkness. It actually says, you know, he forms the light. In other words, um, he forms light that already exists and directs it, but he created darkness. So actually, people have it backwards. People think, oh, first there was nothing, and there was just blackness and darkness, and then chaos and nothingness, and it was horrible. And, and then out of all this nothingness and chaos and everything, uh, that God, you know, wrangled that chaos, and he said, let there be light, and light shone into uh, the chaos of this darkness. Well, it's actually completely backwards. Um, because if you think about creation and the whole concept of coming from something, God invented that concept. The concept of coming from somewhere or coming from something or from someone, God created that concept. Uh, before that, before creation, before time, there was no such thing as coming from something or coming from someone. Um, it was the only uh, person who existed uh, before creation was God. And what is a characteristic of God? Light. And so what was there before creation? God. Ergo, there was nothing but light. There was nothing but love. There was nothing but his spirit. And so God existed, and everything about God eternally existed before creation. And so when you kind of try to wrap your head around that concept, the real true reality is the first thing God created was heaven and earth. And then we note that darkness is there present right there in verse 2. Uh, darkness is already mentioned. And Isaiah 45, 7 says that God created darkness. Um, and so 
Well, we talked about that, like I said, in our other videos, uh, but there's a reason for that. He created darkness as we go through that whole teaching, um, essentially to facilitate um, love, free will, true love, true relationship. Um, the reason for that is, is if you really dig down deep and you, you study the, the theological underpinnings of that, you'll find out very quickly um, with that logic and that reasoning that if we did not have a separation between us and God's direct presence, uh, his direct manifest presence in the domain here of the earth domain, there would be nowhere on earth, nowhere in the universe that you could go where you could not be where you would not be at all times aware of his presence, his light, his glory, his majesty. You would have no choice but to behold him in his glorious um, light and the majesty of his, the spirit of his presence. And so in order to facilitate true relationship, true free will, true love, and true choice, God created this domain to have some separation, to hide himself, um, to give us the opportunity to get to know him um, voluntarily, to want a relationship with him, to see that there's a choice between having a relationship with him or not. And that is the only thing that facilitates free will. And so uh, the earth domain, darkness, and all those things, of course, after the fall, all of those things took on a horrible connotation. And evil, of course, um, loves the darkness and loves its, its little heyday of time that it has to propagate and hide in the shadows. And, uh, but in the very, very beginning, um, there really was no negative connotation between darkness um, there was no negative connotation um, behind um, God hiding himself. Um, it was all uh, done by his wisdom and his um, perfect plan um, to bring us into uh, a loving, true, genuine uh, relationship with him. And so, um, again, I don't want to, just, that's just kind of a summary uh, if you want to get into all that, go look at the um, the first videos that we did in this series. I did a couple on the different aspects of light. And so anyway, there it is. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And so the darkness that he created in Genesis 1-2, or before Genesis 1-2, um, that darkness that he created was not from within him. It was something that he created um, again, to protect us from his direct, magnified, glorious presence. Uh, because until we choose to accept him, and of course we can only do that through his son Jesus Christ, until we choose to do that, and until we receive our resurrection bodies, there is no possible way that we could be in his direct manifest presence without coming unglued at the seams. And so um, very, very important to understand that. A lot of people have that backwards, have it wrong. Um, but again, don't be an obnoxious Bible nerd in your church. Um, share it with caution. Um, if you must share it, share it with caution. In a, in a way that's uh, entreating people to understand a deeper understanding of the, the concepts there instead of trying to be a know-it-all. All right, so uh, moving on. Um, so it's, it's really interesting um, if you study, I did a lot of uh, research for this uh, particular lesson because there is a lot of interesting physics behind it. And um, I'll just uh, demonstrate it real quick. Um, there is a, uh, a professor um, who I was aware of, and I, I've uh, seen some of his stuff in the past, and I, I went back to it to uh, just uh, 
take a look and, and refresh myself on all of that stuff. But, um, you know, there was a, um, you know, a history of this, of, of the uh, genius scientists who, who uh, understood the physics behind light and rainbows and all the rest of it um, way back when. And so, uh, but this particular professor, Walter Lewin, uh, he's done a lot of great uh, videos on this, and you can see it on the channel. He's a professor at MIT. And um, I'll just give you a quick, quick breakdown of this. And let me uh, go back to this view so I can show you here. And this is basically, um, you know, derived from his lessons on, uh, on that. And basically what you see here, uh, the big circle here in the middle, um, this is to um, basically denote a typical raindrop. And if uh, what you see here is this vector here, this is a ray of light um, hitting the um, raindrop at a particular angle. And when it hits the raindrop at that particular angle, the angle of incidence, um, which uh, you can see here based on the radius of the um, raindrop and there will be some reflection some light will reflect off and go off but there will also be what's called refraction and that refraction will go and it'll hit the back of the raindrop if if we're calling uh, this the, the front of the raindrop like the sun is shining this way um, then it'll hit the back of the raindrop and reflect and that reflection will come um, here and then there will be um, as that uh, as that back of the raindrop is here it will um, basically reflect and then refract and this final refraction this one right here that's the one that's the light that you actually see um, from the rainbow is this and it's at a particular angle and so the angle is you can see it right there and that's that crude uh, drawing of the two cones that I've shown there um, 42.3 degree angle that is where you will see the red band of the rainbow and then you'll see the blue band at a slightly different angle at 40.7 which is a very interesting number. I was interesting. To, I was interested to see that um, because it is interesting to note that the year of the flood, when the rainbow, uh, after which the rainbow was uh, instituted as a covenant by God between Him and the earth and all living creatures. Um, well, if you do some arithmetic, you'll find out that the year that happened was. 1656 a.m., meaning 1656 after the creation of the world. And if you understand that, you can do a quick square root of that, and you'll find out that um, actually 40.7, if you square it, that's the year of the flood. So 40.7 squared is 1656. And so I find that very interesting that... Um, Oftentimes, in mathematics and all the calculations um, of God's creation, uh, we find very deep underpinnings uh, to God's um, word and his design. And so uh, if you want to see it, it's a really good, uh, really good video to watch. I'll uh, see about linking it in the description uh, so you can go take a look at it. But... Um, Let's get back to here, or uh, I can just show you real quick uh, here uh, in our tabs. If I can get my screen going right here. There we go. Um, so let me just do a quick uh, search on it and show you. Um, that's what I would search on, uh, Walter Lewin, Rainbow, and you can go... Uh, watch uh, several lectures that he's done on it over the years. Um, probably this one might be the best one uh, to watch. And you can see it. Um, 
if we get rid of this uh, stupid ad here real quick. Um, you can see him uh, giving the lecture on how all the physics of the optics uh, and the angles works for the rainbow. And so he's the expert on uh, the physics of it, and he's uh, written books on it and, and uh, done a lot of work on it. Uh, but we're not here to talk about the physics of it, because as, as interesting as that is, um, we're really here to talk about the, um, the much more important aspect of it, which is what is its uh, spiritual relationship to you and I. And so first of all, let's go take a look at something very interesting. And you'll see actually in this lecture, if you watch it, it's either this one or one of the other ones that you'll find. Um, if you go watch that lecture, you'll note that um, he shows um, some examples of something called uh, white rainbows. And you'll see white rainbows up in like the North Pole region or in a few other places under certain conditions. And these conditions are that the water droplets are incredibly, incredibly small. And so you're talking, um, you know, less than a, a micron. You know, you're talking about millionth of a meter. Uh, if, so if you have very, very, very small water droplets... The water droplets are so small that the angles uh, that are that are required to produce the colored rainbow of you know the red um, with you know the the red spectrum all the way to blue. Uh, so if you if you look at that um, there, the the water droplets are so small that they can't reflect that light, and they act actually only reflect white light. Uh, so, it, but it looks like a white rainbow, and you'll see it in different places and under different conditions. Why? Because you're either ta you're talking about uh, mist, and the mist is so fine that the colors that you would s normally see in the rainbow uh, cannot be produced because the water droplets are too small uh, to produce that array of of angles needed to see the different colors. And so I found that very interesting because what do we know about Genesis um, chapter uh, 2? And let's take a look at it here. And there's I looked at the other places in Scripture where it mentions it. And let's take a look at something very interesting. So in uh, here, notice in Genesis 2.6, uh, so this was before there was rain on the earth in uh, Genesis uh, 2.5. It talks about that. Uh, before there was rain on the earth, um, the earth was under a completely different hydrologic cycle, a whole different system of water. And so there, it says, but there, was, uh, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And so before the hydrologic system changed after the flood, um, the water droplets were so small and the water didn't come from rain it came from mist, and because of that mist, um, up until the time of the flood, people didn't see rainbows because there was no rain, uh, there was no uh, system of of hydrology like like we have now, and it was all completely different. And so again, we talked about that also in our previous videos. So if you want to go back to that, you can go look at our Genesis two videos. But notice this in Acts 13.11, it says, And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist, interesting, and a darkness, and he went about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then in 2 Peter 2.17, notice it says that these things are associated again. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. So I find that interesting that um, this concept of mist comes up three times in Scripture, and that mist is um, the the water is so uh, the water droplets are so minute, they're so almost microscopic that they cannot 
produce the color that we see, uh, the colors that we see of the spectrum of light in the rainbow. And so uh, I find that very, very interesting that um, before the um, flood and the whole water system changed, the mist used to rise from the earth, and therefore um, after the rain and after the flood, and now rain was going to be the way that God watered the earth, now it's time for the rainbow. And so it's kind of a picture of how um, up until... Um, up until the flood, which is what uh, we, as we talked about through First uh, and Second Peter before, is a picture of baptism. So, like the world got baptized, and so up until that point in time, um, people couldn't see the um, colors of the rainbow from the light uh, through rain and water droplets because. The water droplets were um, too finely uh, granular, too mist, uh, you know, too minute in the mist uh, to be able to see uh, the bigger water droplets um, that you can see now uh, through the the rain. You can see those reflections of all the different colors of the the light spectrum uh, through the rainbow. So, uh, very interesting just physics aspect of this, but also it shows that um, that before the flood, things were different. And that's why uh, once the rainbow was instituted, they weren't able to see it before um, in nature. They were not able to see it uh, in nature before until after the flood. And so God reserved it for a time after the flood. And so we're going to take a look at some other spiritual aspects of this, uh, but I just wanted to get some of that physics stuff out of the way um, to get started here. Okay, so now let's get into it. And it says, And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. And what is the covenant? Uh, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of Everything that goes out of the ark to every beast of the earth, I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall a, there, uh, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of the flood. Neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. So that's the covenant God is promising: no more worldwide floods. Okay, so uh, clearly there are localized floods; those continue on to this day. Uh, but that's a completely different um, situation. And again. That's another proof positive that um, we're talking about a global catastrophe, a global flood. Okay, and so uh, because uh, if not, then if it was just a local flood, then obviously God broke his promise here, uh, and we know that that's not true. So we know it was a global, worldwide flood. Uh, there's been subsequent local floods, but that's just um, a normal um, occurrence in nature from time to time, just like there's earthquakes, just like there's um, tornadoes and other other uh, natural disasters, there's still localized floods, but not, never a global flood ever again. Okay, and then it gets into the sign of the covenant. So, and God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make, which I am making between you and me and every living creature that is with you for everlasting generations. And again, uh, please forgive me, I, I memorized this in a different translation, so it's kind of weird for me to try to read it in a translation that I, uh, that I didn't memorize. Uh, but it says here, I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. So... The number of times that this is repeated is so interesting because if you go and you study the, the physics of the rainbow, you'll see that there's, um, in, the, in, in some cases, this has just come out in the last 10 to 15 years, roughly. Um, but there is a first order rainbow. That's the one that you see. Then there's a second order rainbow, which actually um, goes on a, um, a greater measure of reflection 
and that's a lot of times you might notice that you see a rainbow and then right above that rainbow you see a secondary rainbow um, that's a second order rainbow um, now it was theorized based on the physics that there should actually be a third order rainbow um, and even a fourth order rainbow occurring in nature however instead of normally when you see a rainbow you have the sun uh, the sun is directly behind you and it's you know you're looking at your shadow and if you take that angle that 42 degrees uh, from where the sun is is behind you um, casting a shadow in front of you and you take that and you look at 40 42 uh, 0.3 degrees, you know, off in the distance, if there's rain, then you will see a rainbow right there every time. And you can even recreate it. Like uh, many people see rainbows, you know, in your sprinkler system or something like that. And what it is, if the sun is hitting at just the right angle and you um, are in front of the sun, the sun's behind you and the, and the sun is shining, um, and you look at that 42 degree angle, you will see the rainbow. So you, if you know how to set it up, you can go see rainbows all the time, every day, if you want to. You can go, uh, um, you know, set up the conditions and get in the position where the sun is behind you, and you can see rainbows. Now, um, but the interesting thing is that based on the physics of it all, it was believed, theorized, that if you look back in the direction of the sun you should actually see another reflection, a third-order rainbow. Uh, the only problem is it's so difficult to see because you're obviously looking, you know, into the sun. So if you block the sun from your view, you know, you block the sun from your view, um, but you look, you, you see the rainbows in the normal way, the first and second-order rainbows, and then you turn around and you look into the sun, but you block the sun, if there's um, rain there coming from that direction um, as well, being reflected back from the, um, the other rainbows, you will see a third order rainbow. And it was actually um, officially discovered, uh, proven that that theory was correct. And in 2011, 2011, uh, the first person actually photographed a third order rainbow and then just like with the second order rainbow there is a reflection of that as a fourth order rainbow and that has uh, was also finally confirmed shortly thereafter just in the last 10 years uh, 10 to 15 years this stuff has been confirmed that you could you actually have um, four rainbows first second third and fourth order rainbows that occur in nature now, in a laboratory, laboratory with um, highly refined instrumentation and extremely precise uh, light uh, instruments and um, all kinds of uh, fancy um, effects and, and uh, abilities to tweak things and control things um, in the lab setting, you can go beyond those uh, four, order, four orders of rainbow. Uh, reflections, um, but in nature you can only see the one, two, three, four. The four, uh, there's four orders of rainbow um, in nature that you can actually see, observe, and so it's interesting because um, if you examine this carefully and you look at all of the um, times it repeats this sign of the the sign or the token of the covenant, it says it four times. Um, four times and it's something that God can see from his perspective and something that we can see from our perspective and so it is like a covenant a rainbow cuts covenant uh, the rainbow cuts the covenant between us and God and we can see it and he can see it um, so it's coming back in the direction of the sun but it's also coming in the direction of the sunlight hitting the water um, at the same time and so I find that pretty interesting that um, we have uh, this covenant that God has cut between and it's based on light going through water. And so what is the interesting thing about that spiritually speaking? 
So you can go study the physics of it and look at uh, that lecture, and there's other, you know, there's other people who have lectures on it and, and articles on it and Scientific American and scientific journals. And you can go research the whole history of people discovering the, uh, all the secrets to the optics of the rainbow, and that's all well and good. But what is the spiritual aspect here? Think about the spiritual aspect. Um, you can't get rainbows through snowflakes. Um, why? Because they're not translucent. They, you have to be able to go, it has to go, be able to go through. You have, the light has to go through the raindrop and refract and reflect and refract back uh, to be seen. And so w it's well known that we are uh, predominantly composed of water, uh, but what is the true water? The water of the washing of the word, the word of God, the living water. And so that is the spiritual aspect is once you have the living water, you should be see-through. In other words, God should be able to see through you and his light can go through you and refract within you and reflect back to him within you. And so that water um, uh, the, the picture is that God's light is able to go through you because your sin has been washed clean, uh, that you're translucent, that you're naked and unashamed before him. And so when you see that, it's like the water going, uh, the light going into us, um, and we are composed in the natural of water, but in the spiritual, we're composed of the living water, God's Holy Spirit. Remember, God is light, God is spirit, God is love, all those things. And so as the, as the light comes from him, from Christ, into us, because we, are, our sin is washed with the blood of Christ, you have his light, spiritual light, come into us, and reflect back to him. And so that's the spiritual aspect of the covenant. And so uh, let's look at this. Notice it says, um, so let, let's kind of go through this and just take it one at a time. So notice now God is saying, okay, now I've made a covenant. I'm never gonna, you know, once the world is baptized, so to speak, the flood, um, I'm never again gonna destroy with the flood. And when we get baptized, remember, it's like we're destroying our flesh, life. We're we're, we're dying to ourselves, buried with him in baptism, raised to new and eternal life uh, with him. Uh, that's, that's the picture, right? That we are buried with him in baptism and raised to the newness of life uh, in Christ Jesus. And so uh, when, when that happens uh, to us, it's like a picture of, you know, we don't have to destroy um, the flesh anymore. That's something that happened at salvation. And the baptismal, baptismal experience is just simply a symbolic representation of something that's already happened inside of us. And so when that happens, uh, we have the new spiritual life uh, inside of us, and now God's light can, can reflect inside of us and reflect back to him. So he sees his righteousness inside of us because we've accepted Christ's righteousness, his atonement on the cross for us. And so we, uh, that covenant that's cut between us is, um, you know, a beautiful uh, picture of that, um, that godly uh, righteousness that we now have through Christ to be in relationship, back in right relationship uh, with the Father. And so, uh, and so again, this is the sign of that covenant. And notice he's making it between him, or me, and you, and every living creature that is with you for everlasting generations. Okay, so here, he, so he says it again. I set my bow in the cloud. We're going to talk about cloud in a minute, and it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. So now, um, it's the second time that he mentions it. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. It's the third time. 
Now, he says, And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And what is the covenant again? Here's a, a, a repetition of the covenant. That the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And then, notice this, And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. Four times. And in nature, how many uh, orders of rainbow do we have? One, two, three, four orders of rainbow uh, that we can observe in nature. And so four times God um, says uh, the sign of the covenant of the rainbow and what it represents. And so uh, I think that's uh, fascinating. And so... Uh, Let's go look at some other aspects of this now. And so uh, let's get, uh, let's start with um, here. No, nope, I don't want to do that one yet. Let's, let's, uh, let's actually come here first. Okay, so notice this. Uh, starting in Revelation 4 1, and we're going to read through verse 3 here, but this is, uh, this is the rapture, uh, Revelation 4 1. And uh, this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. And I sat and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardius stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And so here, uh, coming from that one who's sitting on the throne, who is God himself, there is a rainbow. And if you go and you you follow that lecture and you look at the um, all the lectures on the different the lectures that he does on the rainbow you're going to see that there's also um, a similar attribute that we see in nature around the sun and around the moon and it is a glory it's called a, a glory because it's light in a circle around and we see it actually um, in depictions of, of the saints uh, you see depictions of ancient art with the saints, and you've seen it before, where you have that, you know, um, that um, circle of, of glory. And the idea is, is that it's God's, it's God's glory that is shining um, through that person. And we, we see hints of this, like even in Exodus, we see Moses. What happened? His face was radiant. Why? Because he had been meeting face to face in the tabernacle directly with God himself. And so as he was meeting with God, um, the light that was upon him was so overpowering that Moses, after he got done speaking uh, with God, he had to ha cover his face with a veil. Again, that is another scripture that talks about that darkness, right? Uh, the darkness is a protection for us uh, because when we're in mortal frame, we cannot handle um, God's direct presence and his glory. Uh, so we, we have to have that time of choosing free will relationship, free will, a true love, true relationship with him. Because if we didn't, if, if there wasn't that separation between us and God, um, there would be nowhere in the universe we could go and not be aware of his mighty, glorious, magnificent presence and his light and his glory, and we would just come undone. And so that even extended uh, to Moses, because when Moses was just simply reflecting the glory of God, uh, when he met him like that in the tent, it was um, an unbelievable, um, it was so unbelievably powerful that when Moses came out of the tent, pe the, the people couldn't handle Moses. Not only could they not handle God, they couldn't even handle Moses because his face was shining with such glory, the glory of the Lord, that he needed a veil to cover himself. 
And so that speaks even to this day. Have you ever been, um, especially maybe in your earlier days of your faith walk, uh, right after you received salvation, or maybe even before you received salvation, you were thinking about it, or you were considering it, or you were contemplating it, and you knew somebody who was, or you maybe know somebody now who's way more spiritual than you are. They are very fully immersed and fully surrendered to the Lord, and they're in full-time ministry or something like that, and they're, they're or you don't even have to be in full-time ministry, just but they are, they are, you know, maybe not professional ministry, but they're in full-time ministry as ambassadors for the king. And their countenance is so powerful, their righteousness, the righteousness of Christ is so strong in them that they're intimidating. They intimidate people. And so you don't want to be around them because it's like the you could just sense the light, the glory the righteousness of Christ in them is so powerful and strong that you don't, you know, there's people that just don't want to be around them. I, I can't stand being around that person because they, uh, the glory that they're shining around uh, through the countenance of their visage is so powerful that it exposes darkness and wickedness. Um, you know, and it, it calls to my remembrance um, scriptures like in in Acts, where it talks about Peter or Paul, you know, just the shadow. They'd be walking in the, in the, the, in the shadows, uh, the shadow that they cast. People would get healed just by them passing over them with the shadow. and uh, The shadow of, of, of Peter and Paul. Why? Because the glory of the, the righteousness of Christ was so powerful in them that, that um, it, they were just... Um, emanating uh, the light of God through their um, through their ministry work that they were completely and totally surrendered and sold out to uh, for God and so uh, think about that pretty amazing to, to contemplate and think about those things but again um, you know when we see the water um, here up in heaven John is actually seeing this in heaven well, now he's seeing the actual direct source of the light, uh, the direct source of the of the light itself being God Himself on the throne. That produces that same effect of the rainbow, uh, that powerful rainbow effect, um, and it's there up in heaven. And then um, this is a this is, there's some really amazing ones here. Um, See, I was trying to find. Um, oh yeah, maybe that's where it is, right there. Let's look at this one first. Revelation 10. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Now think about that. What a sight to behold! You know, his a rainbow was upon his head. You know, he's crowned with, with a rainbow because of this uh, glorious light coming from God um, shining through this angel. And then uh, again, we have... Uh, um, let's look at this one. It's this kind of interesting. I want to go back here and uh, take a look at Ezekiel chapter 1. Um, let's start with verse 4 uh, because we get a picture of this as, as well. He says, And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself. And a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof is the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. And it goes on, and if you go down and skip down to the end of this chapter now, um, where is it? Let's just read this whole passage here, verse 26. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above it. And as I saw the color of amber as the appearance of the fire round about it within, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, 
I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. And the appearance of the bow, there it is. So this is the rainbow. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of the one that spake. And so notice how uh, in the creation, after the fall, um, it wasn't until the flood, a picture of baptism, and, and of course, believer's baptism, which is pictured through Moses, he obeyed the, the Lord God, uh, what he told him to do to build the ark, and so on and so forth. So it wasn't until he was on the ark and passed through uh, the flood and came out the other end of the, the time of the flood with his family out of the ark, it wasn't until that time that they were allowed to see the rainbow. Um, and likewise for us, it's not until after salvation and after we've demonstrated our faith through our, our obedience to the Lord, um, it's at that point and at that time when he starts revealing his glory uh, to us as it was revealed here to Ezekiel um, in this vision that he has in the first chapter. And so uh, amazing stuff. Um, and so it's interesting, if you look in um, um, the colors of the Bible, it's, I kind of did some research on this, and it's, it's pretty fascinating. Um, but the Hebrew in particular is a language that is bereft of colors. Um, and so I, there's, uh, if you go look up the color, the, the words that are translated into the different colors of, of our English words for colors, um, you'll find that the words that are used, um, that there's a lot of inferential um, translation going on. Because, um, as it says here, there are but few real color terms found in biblical or traditional literature. Only white and two of the elementary colors, red and green, are distinguished by name. So, in Hebrew, there's really only official names for white, uh, at least in biblical Hebrew. Uh, there's only, uh, the, the only official words um, that are actually have their own names for their own colors is white red, and green. All the other ones, um, they're inferred by the objects they're describing. And so as you get into a study of that, it's pretty, uh, it is actually fascinating to go see how the translators tried to figure out, okay, well this is describing this object, and we know this object to be um, red, or we know this object to be blue, or this, or we know that this is purple, and because we know it's purple, um, the word that was used to describe it, we're going to translate it purple, or we're going to translate it scarlet, or so on. Um, but there's no, in Hebrew, there's no one-to-one. -one. You can't just say, what's the Hebrew word for scarlet, or what's the Hebrew word for blue? Um, you can't do it. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. You have to uh, infer uh, based off of that. And um, I think I had... Um, I thought I had that up here. Um, maybe not. But um, you, we can go um, look it up. As, let's just... Uh, um, take any one of these as an example um, but let's use let's use um, yeah let's use blue we'll start with blue and then we'll go back and do the other ones okay so this is the first time we see the word blue in scripture in the King James anyway that's in Exodus 25 4 and so if we go look at it um, and use our um, language tools here we can go see that this is the Hebrew word that they're translating blue, so let's... Strong's H, 8504. Tehele. 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 Okay, so if we go look at it, um, now notice that they 
if you kind of look at the the way they derived this, um, it's a feminine noun. It's thread, um, and here it's a violet thread, and they derive that from all of these scripture references. So in other words, they had to go look at all these scripture references, and they come up with the, the idea that, well, because we know that these things that are this, this is describing, um, we know that that must be um, blue. And so they, they're basically inferring and they're taking some guesses here. And so um, that's, um, you know, just something you have to deal with. And same with purple. Okay, so uh, we see here the word that they translate purple is here. Uh, we can get a feel for it here. H713, Ergaman. Ergaman. And you can come, you know, look at all these um, and figure out what the root word um, meant. And if you really break it down and get down to the real root of the word, um, which it describes here, for example, um, you'll see that it was only after a great amount of uh, effort of trying to contextualize every time the word that word was used um, in different contexts and then sometimes it means this sometimes it means that and they kind of uh, they have to uh, really do a lot of translational work um, to try to derive uh, what these colors are because like I said there's no um, direct one-to-one -one, like oh this is blue in English this is blue in Hebrew it doesn't work that way uh, and that's why if you look at different translations you'll see a lot of different translations have different words for some of these colors but I did find something interesting and that was I was trying to find every time it mentioned a color in scripture and I tried to go in order uh, but here's the very first time um, the word green is the first color that we see in the Bible in Genesis chapter 1 and um, it says it again here in Genesis chapter 30 and it says it again in Exodus and Leviticus and you can kind of see where they get it because it's like okay green is this green is this green is this we know herbs are green we know this is green we know that's green and so that's kind of the way they derived okay that means that that word in Hebrew means green. And so uh, you can go right on through and see every time that that word is used. It's used 41 times, uh, translated that way in the King James anyway. And But what I found was, notice this, that there's green. Um, and I believe I found every single one. I could be wrong, but red. And there's several different words for red. I found that very interesting because there's red, there's scarlet, there's vermilion, there's crimson. And there's ruddy. Um, all of them are used to describe different aspects of the color red. And uh, there's five of them. So I thought that was interesting because five is the number of grace. Red is the color of blood. And it's only by the blood of Christ um, that we are able to have grace. And so uh, anyway, notice that you have uh, um, green. The next color that we see in scripture is red. Uh, the first time that happens is Genesis 25. Uh, 25, talking about Esau, and then you have brown in Genesis 30, and that's the only place it actually shows up, the color brown, at least in the King James, and then you have uh, white is in Genesis 30, and of course uh, white is all through the scripture, used in many different contexts, and uh, I think that's the most used, yeah, 75 times. The word white is used in 66 different verses. And then you have scarlet, okay, a, f a form of red, used 52 times um, in different contexts. Then you have gray, and there's a couple of different words for gray. And so here um, it's used for gray hair. Um, and so uh, it's used that way a few times here, uh, mostly talking about uh, the gray-headed or the gray-haired. 
And then you have, um, like we already talked about, blue. I find this interesting because blue is the color of heaven. Um, red or scarlet is the color of man. And then purple is in between. Blue and red make purple. And so as you see that, you have um, man, red, heaven, blue. And what was the... What is the ultimate form of purple? Well, it was one of the priestly colors on the garments. However, uh, it's also the color of royalty. And I'm going to suggest, even though it doesn't specifically come out and say it in Scripture, I'm suggesting to you that after Christ was pummeled and beaten and scourged uh, with the whip and, you know, uh, beaten by the soldiers um, and all the other uh, abuse that he took before the cross, by the time he was up on the cross, uh, his body was likely a pulsating, throbbing mass of bruised, beaten, pummeled flesh. And what does flesh turn into uh, once it's been beaten like that? It turns purple. So remember that they mocked him by putting a purple robe, a royal robe of purple on him. But what was the true royal robe that he wore? Uh, the purple of his beaten, um, whipped, and uh, just completely pummeled flesh. Uh, that was the real royal robes. And so what brings um, heaven uh, and scarlet together, in other words, um, sinful man like Esau, Adam, a man who has blood, you know, the, that word comes from the flush of the face, um, the blood into the face is where you get that Adam, um, and that's actually the root word where we get ruddy from, uh, the red-faced, and how do you get the red-faced man, the, the uh, sinful blood uh, man, uh, back to heaven well what's always in between blue and scarlet purple you have the purple of the our high priest Jesus Christ he's the one that was able to bring the red and the blue back together in him and so uh, as you see that uh, we can also see again notice blue purple and scarlet uh, so you see those together blue purple, and scarlet. Um, and you see it uh, multiple times. Blue, purple, and scarlet. And again, it's all through Exodus here. We have blue, purple, and scarlet. Blue, purple, and scarlet. Uh, talking about the priests. And again, that's the picture. That, that we can't go back to heaven until we have the Christ, the royal Christ, the purple uh, robe of his royalty worn in his bruised, beaten flesh. And so um, then uh, yellow. So we have yellow here. It's only four times, mostly in Leviticus and mostly in regard to leprosy. And then this is the only time that I could find where gold is actually mentioned as a color, uh, specifically yellow. Um, so Let's move on, and let's take a look next at black. Okay, so here black starts in Leviticus 13. And we have it go through um, First Kings, Esther, Job, and you can come look at all these um, all through Scripture. So you have uh, black, and you have uh, the hoary, hoary host, or whorehead. And um, it sounds strange to us because we don't usually use that word anymore but it is in the King James, and it's a word meaning like the the real white, whitish gray of the extreme aged. So if, you, if you've ever seen somebody that has that super gray, white, that super white gray hair, um, you know, and it basically says, thou shalt rise up before the hoary head, meaning uh, the aged, the gray headed, that has that, that striking, um, white, grayish uh, head of hair. Uh, the whole idea was you, you're to rise up before, in other words, uh, there used to be a tradition 
uh, here in the West, um, in America, as as late as the um, as late as the 1960s, the the early to mid 60s, and even carried on into the 70s uh, a little bit. It's almost completely gone now, completely gone. But there used to be a tradition here in America where if a hoary head, in other words, a a gray-headed, white-haired, aged person walked into the room, everybody in the room stood up out of respect for that individual. Um, how, uh, how is that tradition going these days? Um, it's completely gone. Uh, and it, it's sad, but it, there used to be a tradition um, in America and in the West that if uh, somebody with gray hair walked into the room, everybody stood up um, to show a sign of respect. And, and it comes from the Bible, because Leviticus commands it. He says, uh, it says here, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head, and honor the face of the old man, and fear thy God. I am the Lord. Uh, and so that, that again is a color. Uh, it means frost, like it's a, it's a frosty color of, of, of white, like ice. Okay, and then uh, vermilion. Now this one's interesting because it's uh, in the King James, but only twice. Uh, you have vermilion, so that's one of those words for red. And then um, I was perplexed because I couldn't find orange in the Bible. I was like, there's got to be orange somehow. And then um, I was looking at Ezekiel for the rainbow, and I found it here. Um, keep in mind that amber, it's the color of amber, but this is one of those inferred words, okay? So it's not like amber, and, and we know that to be the color orange, um, like a, but it's like a metallic orange. It's, a, it's an electric orange. It's a, it's a translucent orange. It's, it's more than just orange. Uh, it's like a fiery orange. And so uh, if you look at it, though, and you look at the word uh, translated here uh, for amber. Let me see if I can find it here. There it is. Okay, so here is the word that it's translated. Uh, chasmat. Let's hear it pronounced correctly. H2830. Chasmal. Hashmal. Hashmal. And so notice what the, uh, and I actually looked this up in my uh, theological uh, word study of the Old Testament. Um, and and this is pretty much correct, a shining substance. Notice it's like electrum or bronze or brass. It's, it's, a, it's just such a striking color that it can't really be defined, so they try to define it. Uh, by these various types of metal. Um, and it only shows up here. And so in the Hebrew, uh, the Chaldee lexicon, uh, it's like brass made smooth or polished bronze. Um, you know, it's that, that deep, rich, yellowish, orangish, metalish, translucentish, um, amber uh, color. And so the, the King James uh, translators translated it amber. I think correctly. I think that is probably the best, um, the best word in English that we have to convey uh, what Ezekiel was seeing, uh, based on the description. Okay, and then we have um, okay. Per, oh, there it is. Crimson. Okay, so we have crimson is used. That's one of those red red words. Um, and then in Zechariah, we have a few other interesting words. Uh, sorrel. And this, you'll only find this one in the, the ESV or the New American Standard. Uh, the King James has a different word here because it's a hard word to translate. Uh, so, but you'll see sorrel uh, there in Zechariah, describing the colors of the horses. And then bay, uh, bay, that is a color, okay? So, uh, um, so describing, again, the color of the horses, uh, that's a color that you're, you're talking about there. And then, um, again, that's the other color for red, ruddy. 
and um, oh, that's something else. Okay, yeah. So I want to do that last. Okay. So, but if you look at all those colors, um, I I tried to find every single one that was mentioned. Some are only mentioned in one translation or the other. Uh, but I came up with, guess what, exactly 17 different colors that are mentioned in Scripture. Uh, so starting with uh, green, uh, red, brown, white, uh, scarlet, gray, um, hoary, uh, purple, blue, uh, yellow, black, um, vermilion, uh, amber or orange, like fire. Um, which one was this? Crimson, sorrel, and bay. And so, uh, and ruddy. That's the last one. So if you look at it, you look at all those, uh, different colors. Um, it's in interesting to find out that there was, I could identify 17 different colors in scripture. And so uh, the uh, color gold itself and silver itself, uh, as far as I could tell, they were never used to describe a color, like um, an adjective. Uh, or even when it said golden, it was like the golden calf. Uh, so in other words, it was the calf made out of gold. It wasn't like, it wasn't using it as a color. It was using it as what the substance it was made out of, gold. Or likewise with silver. Um, I, could never, I couldn't find anywhere where it said silver, like silvery, like silvery color-wise. It was always silver, the actual substance, the actual element, silver. Um, so I, I, uh, I didn't include those because I couldn't find where they were used as a color. The only place where I showed you was the uh, yellow where it said yellow gold, but it used the word yellow instead of gold. So um, I found that interesting. So uh, to wrap this up, this has been kind of a long one, but I did a lot of research on it, and uh, I hope it's blessed you. But I want to finish off with this because I looked at uh, this from a prophetic perspective as well, as I always like to do. And notice this. Um, so... He says, God says, um, I set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. Well, that's interesting. So he sets his bow in the cloud and when he brings a cloud over the earth, the bow shall be seen in the cloud. That's interesting. And between, uh, and the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I remember the everlasting covenant. And so remember the bow, in the spiritual context, is us uh, reflecting the righteousness of Christ in our lives through faith. And we have taken the light of God and we carry the light of God within us now and so think about this context now uh, maybe you see where I'm going with this but let's now look at um, let's start with Hebrews 12 and it is the same Greek word so I looked it up um, because you know the Hebrew is translated into Greek with the Septuagint. It's a variation of the same word though, but I can show you that. Uh, so just to make sure, let's yeah, let's actually go. Um, let's go make sure that we cover that, cover our bases there. Uh, so let's go here. And we're going to look at um, the word cloud here, right here. And in Hebrew, it's this. H6051. Anon. Anon. Okay, 
so cloud, cloudy, a cloud mass, a cloud mass, a theophonic cloud, that means a, a godly cloud, or the, the Shekinah glory cloud, is what it's talking about there. Uh, but if you come down and you look at the um, Greek, and why can't I find the Greek? What's wrong with this? Um, oh, I think you have to look at it here from this perspective, yeah. Okay, so if we come down and look at the Greek, this word right here, that word in Greek, let's go look at it. Notice it's Strong's G3507, that's the, the word that's translated cloud in Greek. So let's... Strong's G3507, Nephele. Nephele, 3507, but notice it's from 3509, meaning cloud, right? cloud. And so notice this, if we come here to Hebrews 12, 1, and we see wherefore seeing also we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Remember it was 3507, but it's based on the word 3509, which is what this says right here. It's that same word. And so the Hebrew is translated from the Greek in that same word. The Greek word is the same as the Hebrew word there, 3507, 3509. It's just a variation of that same word, a different tense of that same word. And so there it is. And so with that said, let's go look at this now. Uh, Wherefore, seeing we also are composed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Wow. Wow. Well, let's look at that. What does that mean? A cloud? Are we talking about um, a cumulonimbus cloud? Or are we talking about something much more significant? Uh, because let's look at the definition of this now. Used to denote a great shapeless collection of vapor obscuring the heavens as opposed to particular indefinite masses of vapor, etc., etc. But what is the preeminent meaning here? A cloud? A large, dense multitude, a throng. Um, and so it's talking about people, okay? And it's even used this way in Homer with the Iliad. It's used by Herodotus and others. This uh, word is used to denote a throng of people, a massive, you know, and that's what it's talking about here, a group of people. And notice this in First Thessalonians 4. Notice this, um, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Hmm. Interesting. Cut up together with them in the clouds. Notice 3507, the same word, Nephele. Strong's G, 3507. Nephele. Nephele. So, um, when you think about it like that, from that perspective, notice that Genesis 9, uh, speaking of um, the rainbow, and the covenant of the water and the light. Okay, so the, the covenant of water and light that God cut between him and us is uh, speaking of ultimately um, us having his light through the blood of his son Jesus Christ reflecting uh, back to him. Uh, it's a picture of the rainbow and all the, the colors of the rainbow. And we know from Revelation chapter 21 and 22 where it talks about all the foundation stones of all those different colors. Um, it's going to be a color so intense that you can't even fathom it. Um, the, we're, we're just seeing a, a simulation of it right now, really. I mean, when, when we get to the ability to see the true... Uh, with our resurrection bodies, um, it's going to absolutely um, just blow people away. 
you're going to be blown away uh, by that. And so, uh, anyway, um, I think we caught everything I wanted to catch in this uh, video now. Um, and I think that's it. So uh, we'll just stop it right there. I know this was a long one, uh, but it did have a lot to it. And we skipped last week uh, for me to be able to put this together. Uh, so I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you're enjoying our Genesis series. Hope you enjoyed uh, being taken through the rainbow. And um, we will see you here, there, in the air, in the cloud, the great cloud of witnesses, um, to meet the Lord in the air. Or... Until then, we'll see you in the next video. God bless you.